And again, I want to thank everybody for joining me uh, for the third webinar. And I hope everybody has a chance to have seen the first two and to uh, have taken a look at Andy Kaufman's uh, brilliant uh, webinars that he did and have had a chance to read out loud Sleeping Beauty, otherwise known as Little Briar Rose to some people. So let's get into it. And uh, most of the questions that I've had still revolve around how do we know whether what's currently happening uh, is caused by a virus or something else. So I thought I would uh, go into that a little bit because in some ways that remains the key to the kingdom. And in understanding that, um, we change our whole worldview. And let me just say, first of all, that I understand that I'm asking people to radically rethink the way that we have been taught and educated to see the world. Not only am I asking you to do that, I have in some ways asked myself to do that. And I can tell you that in this last month, in some ways I've learned more about medicine than I can remember in a long time. Um, and so some of the things may be actually different than I said a month ago. And so let's go over a little bit of the conceptual framework of what I'm talking about, because I think that puts this into perspective. And again, even though I've been questioning these things at least since the early 1980s, um, it's a process for all of us. We are just re-educating ourselves on how we see the world. And all I can say is it seems clear to me that the way we see the world right now isn't exactly working out for the best. So the way I thought I would start to do this is to just pick another example so you can, in a sense, see, I guess you, what you would say is the absurdity of this uh, issue. So the example that I thought I would start with is imagine uh, you're an investor and it's unfortunate that I can't see people's hands being raised or see your reaction. So I'll just have to guess. And I'm an inventor and I invented a new device, which is a ping pong ball that can knock down brick walls. And this is a wonderful invention because now it allows us to do demolitions much easier. And so all you have to do is take this new ping pong ball and throw it at the wall and it will knock the brick wall or literally almost any wall down. And that saves time and energy and you don't have to bang walls and you don't have to get wrecking crews and all that stuff. So I've now invented that and I'm looking for investors for this and all you folks out there, you're the investors. So of course, you would probably ask me to show you something that demonstrates, because it's a bit of a weird concept, you know, one wouldn't necessarily think that a ping pong ball could knock down a brick wall. So of course you would ask me to demonstrate that this in fact is real. So of course I would say, sure. So here's what I would do. I would take a ping pong ball and I would get a very small brick wall. So it's a sort of demonstration wall. And I would put the ping pong ball in a bucket of stones and rocks and maybe ice cubes and a few other things. So one ping pong ball in this big bucket. And I would throw it at the brick wall, the small brick wall. And I would demonstrate that the brick wall fell and therefore, I have now proved that the ping pong ball can knock down a brick wall. Now, I think most of you, and I won't ask for uh, raising hands, but if you want to, you can, um, would say, that's not really proof because you don't know whether it was the ping pong ball, which is unlikely, or all the rocks and bricks and, or uh, ice cubes and everything else that was in that big bucket. 
And so that would, for most of us, would not be sufficient proof. Now, the reason I say that is because if you want to prove that a virus causes a disease and you uh, take somebody's snot who's sick and you introduce that into another person without purifying it, that's more or less exactly the same as throwing a bucket full of bricks with one ping pong ball in it and then claiming that you've proven the ping pong ball uh, is the reason why that it knocked down the bricks. So, okay, I'm the inventor. I can accept that that may not be proof. So what I did then, which I'm about to show you, except of course, I'm not gonna show you this right now, but I created a computer animation where I now show you this ping pong ball and I shoot it out of this device and it knocks down the computer animated brick wall. And again, I think most of us would say, I mean, that's certainly kind of, graphically interesting, but that in no way constitutes proof that an, a real ping pong ball could break down the brick wall. So then I'm getting a little frustrated now because I'm sensing you don't believe me. I, I would demonstrate that this is not your usual ping pong ball. This ping pong ball has little spikes on it. This ping pong ball has internal components, these little, uh, proteins or little uh, things inside the ping pong ball. And these were all designed to facilitate the knocking down of brick walls. So there was a little piece inside that grabs onto the wall and sticks to it, etc. So I would describe all these different components of the ping pong ball. And then I would say, there, that's proof that this ping pong ball can knock down the brick wall. And again, of course, most of you would say, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's interesting that there's these components in it, but that doesn't prove anything. And again, there's a very analogous situation. Some people send me stuff and say, here's this New Yorker article, and it describes all these different components inside this virus, and some of them stick to this, and some of them stick to that, and some of them facilitate this. By the way, you can't actually prove that all of those components came from the same virus. But even if you did, nobody would think that that's proof that this ping pong ball could knock down the brick wall. So then again, this is getting frustrating for me as the inventor. So I say, yeah, but when we go to the, uh, all the different walls that have been knocked down, in some cases, we find certain parts of ping pong balls in the dust and the debris underneath the wall. Now, we don't find that in all of the brick walls that are knocked down, but we certainly find it in some. And not only that, when we look at the uh, brick wall with the dust that, contain, that was knocked down from the wall, we find an approximately 80% homology with the components of my new ping pong ball. And one thinks, well, that's interesting. It looks like there's something that's similar to ping pong balls, 80% is a lot of, you know, quote, genetic homology between the dust and a ping pong ball. So that's interesting, but I don't think anybody would prove, would say that's proof that this ping pong ball knocked down the walls, especially when you consider, as Andy demonstrated in his video, while 80% homology with other ping pong balls sounds like a lot, it turns out the genetic homology between humans and chimpanzees is actually 96%. And as far as I know, nobody is saying that we're chimpanzees. So finally, I'm very frustrated because you don't seem to get it. And I say, yes, but I'm going to show you five experts who are tenured professors at prestigious universities and all of them are students and studying the, uh, the effect of ping pong ball allergy on knocking down brick walls. And they all say this is a very interesting new invention and they need more study. And so they need a $500 million grant to study how exactly the mechanism and the effect of this ping pong ball would be on knocking down walls. And I think at that point, 
you would be so frustrated and you would say, Tom, all I care about, show me a video or show me in person somebody throwing the ping pong ball at a wall and the wall knocking down. And if you can't do that, I'm not interested. And in a nutshell, that's all I'm saying here. Show me a purified virus that causes disease. And as far as everybody knows, that has simply not been done. And in most realms of life, that's the only thing we would accept as any kind of credible evidence. Now let's get into this even a little bit further here uh, because we can even expand this whole theory of do viruses cause disease and even expand it to bacteria. In other words, do germs cause disease? And just to be clear here, when I speak of germs, I'm not speaking of worms or parasites. I'm speaking only of viruses and bacteria. So again, let me give you an example to help you conceptualize this so you can really think this through. So imagine this scenario. Uh, you have uh, some milk from a cow and people drink the milk and then they get sick with diarrhea. And everybody wants to know why this happened. So you do a microscopic examination of the milk and you find a bacteria called Listeria in the milk. And you know that there is at least reports that an infection drinking Listeria bacteria causes diarrhea in humans. So it's a very clear situation. The milk has Listeria in it. The person drinks the milk with Listeria. They get diarrhea. That's the end of the story. You've, you think you've essentially proven the bacteria causes the disease. However, I think all of us would agree that there actually is a different way of looking at this. And the different way is Maybe, which actually was the case most often with cows with, with listeria, is that somehow you've improperly fed the cow. They used to do it with swill milk. They sometimes feed cows cardboard or grains or other things that are inappropriate for the cow. Sometimes you could even poison the cow with DDT or other toxins or worming medicine. And now you end up with toxins in the milk because after all, we know that all toxins in our bodies, we know this from breast milk studies, always end up in the milk. So an alternative explanation is the listeria are there in the milk in order to biodegrade the toxins. In other words, that is actually the function of bacteria in nature. For example, if you put stuff into your compost pile that doesn't belong there, then you'll get funky bacteria to biodegrade what you shouldn't have put in your compost. And nobody in their right mind would say your compost pile has an infection. That's very clear. The bacteria, as they always do in nature, they biodegrade that which is dead or diseased. Uh, another example, if you poison your pond, eventually you will often get uh, things like algae growth. Again, nobody would say that the algae is an infection. The algae isn't good for you, and the algae actually may have toxins in it itself, but the algae fundamentally, because this is the way that nature works, is biodegrading the toxins. Now, it is true that the, the fact of growing algae may cause other troubles, but still, I think every rational person would say the source of this problem is the poisoning of the pond or the poisoning of the cow. Now, so those are two different, equally as plausible ways of looking at it. One is, the cow was perfectly fine and it happened to grow listeria. And the other is the cow was poisoned 
and the listeria are nature's way of biodegrading the poisons. So the question is, how can we distinguish between these two? And if you think about that for a minute, and usually I would ask people, just think about that for a minute. How would you distinguish between those two? And the answer is actually very clear. The only way, and this is why I started out with the ping pong example, the only way, and I cannot emphasize this enough, the only way that any rational person would be convinced would be if you take the milk and you purify the listeria, in other words, you isolate the listeria from the milk so that you're sure that the only thing you have is listeria, not anything else from the milk, because it may be the toxins in the milk that are causing the diarrhea. Now, and then you would take this purified listeria, you would give only that to another person and see if they got sick. Now, I would only point out there is even a problem with that potentially, because it could be that the listeria are essentially eating or biodegrading the poisons and they may themselves be poisoned. But let's not worry about that for a minute because I will grant you that if you could uh, introduce a pure culture of listeria and make somebody sick, that fulfills all of Koch's postulates. So the question then, which is the part that I've really had to struggle with. And only I would say in the last month have I been really convinced of this through my own research and listening and watching to so many people who spent decades looking into this is, has that actual study ever been done? Now, most people would say it actually has. And the person who did that was named Louis Pasteur. He was the uh, French scientist of the time in the late 1800s. He was the originator of the germ theory, essentially, not that it really started with him, but he essentially popularized it. And he spent decades of his life doing exactly this, isolating bacteria from sick people, uh, purifying it supposedly, giving it to normal people and proving that germs were the source of disease. Germs in this case meaning bacteria. But the same thing applies with viruses. And he published it. He was uh, feted by the prime ministers of Europe. He had finally proven this. The trouble is Pasteur actually was known as a fraudster and kind of a charlatan in a, by many people. And one of the ways we know that is because he actually, believe it or not, kept a personal diary where on the one hand, he would publish data showing this, uh, this effect of contagion of introducing or giving animals Ger pure germs and causing them to be sick. And meanwhile, he was writing a personal diary in which he claimed that not once in his entire career was he ever able to make an animal sick by giving them purified, isolated bacteria. Not once. He instructed his family members to never publish this diary which apparently one of his sons or son-in-laws or stepsons or somebody who I guess didn't like him very much, um, he actually did publish it. And you can see how Pasteur essentially fraudulently claimed these results when nothing of the sort ever happened. One of the ways we know this is that we now know now that on his deathbed, Pasteur apparently said, the germ is nothing, the terrain is everything. And by terrain, he means, is the cow poisoned? And essentially, those studies, purifying viruses or bacteria and making other animals sick in the same way that they would normally get sick, like aerosolized viruses or drinking 
purified bacteria to cause diarrhea. As far as I know, and as far as the other people who've looked into this, this has never been done. In other words, the, the only criteria that we would accept with the ping pong ball, throw the darn ping pong ball at the wall and see what happens. Isolate the bacteria or virus, give it to a normal person and see what happens. We know what happens, which is basically nothing. Now, as a result of this, uh, the people who were convinced that infectious disease was real and that bacteria and then later viruses did actually cause disease, they came to a, a essentially a fork in the road where they couldn't prove Koch's postulates, which is basically the laws of logic. Another way I describe this is like, if you wake up, uh, if you, before you go to bed, you park your car in the street like we do in San Francisco, and then you, want it, you wake up in the morning and you want to know whether your car is still there. So anybody would say the way to do that is to go outside and look and see if your car is there. But that's Koch's postulates. And Koch's postulates were never proven for viruses or bacteria as far as we can see. So they decided either they could abandon the theory and look for a whole different model for how and why people get sick, or they could change Koch's postulates. In other words, we no longer have to go outside and look to see if the car is there. We could say to ourselves, well, nobody would bother to steal our car, so it must be there. Uh, so that's essentially what happened. And then they became Rivers postulates, which Andy in his uh, webinar went through. And then later they became what are called Hills, uh, Hills postulates or Hills rules. So this I found on Wikipedia as the new way that we decide whether or not a virus is the cause of a disease or a bacteria. Because again, they couldn't prove po Koch's postulates, which is basically simple logic. So the, the, the solution was to change the postulates. And there's about 10 or 11 of these postulates, which I won't read them all, but I am gonna read three. And I just wanna point out, these were apparently made in around 1965, middle 60s. And these are still to this day accepted widely by the public health community and by epidemiologists for how we prove viral causation. So let me just read three of them. Number, number three, causation is likely if there is a very specific population at a specific site with no other likely explanation. In other words, you can now say that a virus caused this disease if a bunch of people get sick and you can't think of another reason why they got sick. Uh, num postulate number five says, quote, Greater exposure should generally lead to a greater incidence of the effect. That sounds reasonable. However, in some cases, the mere presence of the factor can trigger the effect. In other cases, an inverse propor uh, proportion is observed. In other words, greater exposure leads to a lower incidence. So if you translate that, what it means is if you have a greater exposure to this virus, you will have a greater incidence of the disease, or it may not have any effect on the disease, or it may lead to a lower effect of the disease or a lower incidence of the disease. I would only say that that covers all your bases. In other words, more exposure could get worse, could be the same, or could get better. And then number eight, is, quote, occasionally it is possible to appeal to experimental evidence, which means, I guess, occasionally it's not possible to, to appeal to experimental evidence, and so you just have to guess, or you just have to believe that that's what's happened. Now, I'm all for believing in things, right? And I don't want everybody to send me Bruce Lipton's book on the biology of belief. 
I like believing in things. I think it makes a big difference, as I'll say in a minute, what we think. But I don't want people to prove that a virus is the cause of disease because they believe it or not. And so uh, actually then I decided to look into who actually was the originator of these Hill postulates because it wasn't clear. And you know, this is a time where we have to be very clear about our research and all. So I put my team to work on it and we tried to figure out who actually came up with these postulates. And at the end of the day, we came to two possible sources. Uh, one was Daffy Duck and the other was Tinkerbell from uh, Peter Pan. And it turns out, I don't think Daffy Duck was around then, so it could only be Tinkerbell, which is based on the theory that if we believe hard enough, it must be true. And again, I have nothing against believing things, uh, but I I don't want us to prove that viruses cause disease without any experimental evidence or just because we can't think of another cause. So I think I'm going to leave this whole viral thing uh, for now, except to say that in my, when I talked about uh, the three levels of this, so the first level is the sort of normal viruses, normal Koch postulates. The second level is the exosome theory, which is what Andy and Sayer and others have been talking about. In other words, it turns out, and the reason you find this ping pong dust at some of the sites where demolitions have occurred, uh, the ping pong dust would be like the exosomes. So there's a whole lot of things that create exosomes, which are actually as I originally said, essentially excretions of our own poison cell. There are many things that cause this, including incubating uh, your virus or snot, unpurified snot in lung cancer cells, which is originally how they described this coronavirus. Um, so these, essentially these exosomes, which look identical to viruses, can be produced by lots of different influences, including, again, as Andy demonstrated, one of the things they can be produced by is fear. And that is probably the explanation, in fact, for sure, assuredly is the explanation of why you find these viruses associated with people who are sick and poisoned and a whole lot of other things.